Listener Production. Hi there, Helen Smith here with this afternoon's episode of The Briefing. Dupes in the beauty and fashion world are nothing new, with some brands marketing themselves as dupe creators. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, dupes is another name for a product or item that is a duplicate, a near identical substitute for a high end product at a lower price. And that's exactly what brands like Emco Beauty have capitalized on. The makeup and beauty products company's CEO, Shelley Sullivan, has said Emco Beauty is all about lux for less, providing quality products for less. And that's exactly what they've done. One of their most famous dupes is their Flawless Glow Luminous Skin Filter. It sells in supermarkets and chemists for about half the price of Charlotte Tilbury's Hollywood Flawless Filter Foundation, which retails for around $70. Fashion brands alike are also regularly duping large brands and trending products, but it feels like the combination of a global cost of living squeeze and social media influencers reviewing products online that go viral is happening more than ever before. And how do so many brands and companies get away with it? Malia Saunders is a partner with Thompson Gear Lawyers and specialises in media, entertainment, intellectual property and privacy law. Malia, how does a company get away with making dupes? So dupes are really a grey area under IP law. They're different from counterfeit goods. So counterfeit goods are usually an identical reproduction of the original product, so the design of good or whatever. And that's actually illegal under the trademark act. So counterfeiting is is a crime and is an offence. Um, whereas a dupe generally isn't an identical reproduction. It it copies the look and feel of an original product. They don't generally reproduce any logos, which can be registered trademarks, and they often are sufficiently different from the original that they get around um, other types of, of IP laws. Another key issue under Australian law is this thing called the copyright design overlap. So it's this kind of issue with registered designs and copyright protection of goods. And it means that if you don't have a registered design prior to kind of launching your product, selling your product, then you can also lose copyright protection So copyright protects artistic work. So, you know, the design, the drawing, um, design of a good. And once that's applied to a product, once it's actually manufactured and it's industrial applied to over 50 products, you can lose that copyright protection as well. So you're kind of without any recourse under design law or copyright law. Um, An exception to that is works of artistic craftsmanship. So they're things like... Um, jewellery, handbags, um, belts, hats, like millinery, that sort of thing, where there's a real element of aesthetic um, originality craftsmanship where a designer has been very heavily involved. Copyright can still protect works of artistic craftsmanship even if there's no registered design, but there's very little case law in Australia on this stuff, so it is uncertain as to whether certain products will actually fall within the definition of works of artistic craftsmanship. It's really uncertain. That's kind of why companies can get away with with selling dupes because traders aren't necessarily willing to pursue legal proceedings in circumstances where it's not certain whether they'll be successful and there's a lot of cost involved. On the back of that, I see bigger businesses like high-end luxury businesses or businesses that have a lot of money and backing behind them, they tend to sue other businesses who also have a lot of money behind them. But what about the small businesses? How can they kind of protect their products, I guess, or is there anything they can actually do? It's really tricky and it's not a satisfactory state of the law Um, Because these smaller businesses are often coming up with these amazing designs, uh, novel and unique products, and then as soon as they get a measure of success, these bigger companies kind of seize on it and and mass produce them. And if they don't have a registered design from the outset, then they can be a bit between a rock and a hard place. So it's definitely worth 
getting legal advice before you launch your product if you think that you've you want to invest in protecting it to get that legal advice to see whether you can register a design so the design registered design will kind of give you a monopoly over that design for five years and you can extend it for up to 10 years and it's worth noting there were some amendments to the designs Act recently which mean that um, you also get a 12-month grace period so even if you kind of do disclose the design before like at the time of selling it or you know before kind of putting it into the market you have a 12-month period from that disclosure to still register the design yeah so what does someone have to prove when suing another company for a dupe so there's different aspects of ip law that can be relevant so as i mentioned one is um a registered if you have a registered design or a registered trademark and that's being infringed then Um, You essentially need to show that the dupe uses a trademark or a design that is substantially identical or similar to your registered trademark or design without a licence or authority to do so. So that's those kind of categories. Otherwise, if you want to look at copyright infringement, you need to show that the dupe reproduces a substantial part of an original artistic work. So that could include a sketch, a fabric pattern, an artistic work could actually be, you know, a floral kind of fabric um, pattern that's original or a logo can be an artistic work or an, a work of artistic craftsmanship. And, again, you have to show that that's been done without a licence um, from the copyright owner. So on that, I have heard of this 15% rule where a company just has to change a product by 15% to make it legal. Is that true? No. The 15% rule is a total myth. Um, I think because this area of law is so complex, there's a lot of misconceptions about it. And so um, there's often like they try to simplify, people try to simplify it and try to find that way through. But the courts have said over and over again, it's not a quantitative analysis, it's a qualitative analysis. So they'll look at, you know, what is being copied? Um, Is it an important or essential part of the original work that's being reproduced? And if it is, so if it's like the key kind of aesthetic quality or essential part of the original is being copied, then even if that's a small, small part of the original, it can still amount to infringement. So what about retailers selling these dupes? Are they liable if a business proves that their product is a duplicate or has been duplicated? Selling goods which feature a false trademark, so counterfeit goods, is an offence under the Trademarks Act. So if you, even if you didn't produce those goods, those counterfeit goods, even just selling them in the market can be an offence. But there are defences for innocent infringement. So if a trader sells a product not knowing that it is a trademark, a registered trademark or that a design was registered or that it infringed, it infringed another trader's intellectual property rights, then that can be a defence to any infringement. Often there'll be agreements, contracts entered into between a manufacturer and and sellers of goods and there might be warranties that the goods don't infringe intellectual property rights um, and potentially indemnities as well. So that is an interesting thing to look at. So if the manufacturer has or designer of the dupe has made promises to the retailer that it doesn't infringe IP, there could be recourse as between the the originator and the um, and the reseller as well. We are in a cost of living crisis. And people are kind of looking for those bargains, the cheaper option. So should we be critical of people buying dupes? It is tricky. Obviously, a lot of the the dupes in the market replicate designer items, which are out of reach for a lot of consumers. But I guess when you think about it, ultimately, intellectual property rights are there to protect creative endeavours. So... They're there to to allow creatives, whether it be fashion designers or other kind of um, traders um, who are producing artworks or music or literary works like books, that's their livelihood. And so they are coming up with these creative ideas and products and they want to make, you know, make a living out of them. So 
by supporting dupes, I guess you are kind of diverting the market for those goods. And so it kind of, it can be a disincentive um, for people to invest in those creative pursuits. But at the same time, you know, you can understand why people love dupes because they, they do kind of satisfy a different market, I think. That was Malia Saunders from Thompson Gear Lawyers. Thanks for listening. That's it for today's briefing. The team will be back in your ears bright and early tomorrow morning at 6am with all the latest headlines and a deep dive. I'm Helen Smith. Thanks for listening. Listener.